Hello there. It is Friday again, another day for me to join you here in our reactive Facebook page live and then recorded, um, of course, on our Facebook page and YouTube. My name is Julie Hirschberg. I am the owner of Reactive Physical Therapy and Wellness, uh, where it is our mission to help people with neurologic diagnoses recover their movement, their strength, their confidence in a way that truly changes the brain. And we do this a lot. We do it through one-on-one -on -one therapy. We do it with people in group exercise and personal training. And we work with other therapists and, uh, and really share what we're learning all of the time. And one of the things that I'm so excited to share about today is based on a webinar that I, I did for people with neurologic disorders this week on the latest literature and evidence um, and practical applications of incorporating exercise for neuroplasticity. So to actually make those brain changes. So um, just this last Monday, we we did this did this webinar. Um, it was really a highlight of my week. Um, it was a free webinar uh, for people with neurologic diagnoses, really about how exercise can change the brain, why it does it, and the practical ways to incorporate that every day. Um, and there's been so much great research that has been published just in this last year, which is, amazes me because we're we're in a pandemic, that I wanted to share a couple of pieces. I actually like hard copy printed a couple of articles because I love them so much and I've been sharing them so much with other people. So for today, we're, we're not gonna do the whole hour long webinar, but I wanna share some highlights for you. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the latest evidence of exercise induced neuroplasticity, specifically like what came out this year. Um, how can we prescribe exercise to improve some of that central nervous system connectivity? Um, this is a big topic for us uh, recently because we have been working really hard on a new course that we're putting together for October on um, central nervous system connectivity. And then finally, what does this mean for neurologic disorders? What do we know and can apply right away? So um, I'm so excited. I got to start with the research. So um, a couple of really great articles that have come out this year and their review articles and their systematic reviews and they're looking at randomized controlled trials. And it's a really nice way to look at a huge piece of literature. So this one is from um, Trends in Neuroscience. 2020. Um, I think it's from July. So COVID paper. Awesome. And um, I printed this one out because particularly there's this really lovely table in here. But this particular article is called Effects of Exercise on Brain and Cognition Across Age Group and Health States. So um, I like I like that just even in the title because it's looking at all of the literature across different age ranges and whether people have a neurologic disorder or a, or different disorders. So they even have a really nice box in here um, on brain or brain cancer, excuse me, breast cancer. So I, I found that really fascinating to look at can we make changes in the brain while our bodies might be fighting off um, or going through treatment for another disease, for example. So this article and this particular graph, I love it. By the way, I'll put a link to the article um, in the comments here when I'm done, but I love this graph. So I want to show it to you. What, it, what we're looking at here down the side is um, age. So young, young to old, and then different types of evidence of neuroplasticity occurring. So in this first one, level one, really looking at cellular and molecular changes and signaling changes that can occur. Level two is brain structure and function. And level three that I love is mental states and higher order behaviors. And this one, I feel like, especially right now in the middle of the pandemic, like we could use some evidence and we could use 
some exercise as treatment for um, changing our mood or improving our sleep, right? So just very, very briefly, as they went through the literature um, and looking at the different ages, we can see that there are cellular changes that occur with exercise. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, one of my favorite words in the world, um, is has increased expression. And so what this means and what I talked about in the webinar, by the way, I guess I'll I'll post the link so you could download that webinar too. Again, it's geared for people with neurologic disorders, um, but it's got a lot of good information. Um, but that brain-derived neurotrophic factor, one of the things I talk about in the webinar is how that really is just like a wonder drug for the brain. And there have been several studies that look at combining uh, rehab and task specific training and skill training after aerobic exercise because BDN BDNF is expressed after exercise. And so you can get more benefit out of your practice by practicing after aerobic exercise. I find that fascinating. Let's all do aerobic exercise before learning a new task, maybe before studying for, for a test or doing a test, for example. So anyway, those are some of the molecular pieces. Level two, structure and function. So we know we can see white matter changes and function. Hippocampus volume. I love the hippocampus, by the way. It's a big memory center for us. Um, increasing the volume is very important. So we can see increased hippocampal volume. Um, also in older adults, increased hippocampal volume, cortical volume, white matter changes, and brain structure. So all of those things really saying, um, which is like point number two that I want to talk about today, is we can make central nervous system changes simply through exercising. Um, so anyway, really great article. Highly recommend it. Um, a second one that I really like that came out, um, Chrissy, our fellow, actually shared this on our Slack channel, um, and I was so thankful. This one's um, also from 2020, the effective exercise training on brain structure and function in older adults, a systematic review based on evidence from randomized controlled trial. So really, uh, really, really um nice systematic review. And what I love about a good systematic review, especially if you're trying to get caught up in the literature, is, um, and let me just give you an example of the table here, is you get really nice, concise tables of some of the big pieces of literature so that you can go in and see specifically what kinds of exercise. So for example, aerobic, resistance, um, control what what they did in the control groups and then they can see uh, in this particular one they look at different areas of the brain and see where those changes took took place and what we're finding more and more is that different types of exercise affects different parts of the brain and so when we think about how we might prescribe exercise we might want a variety of things or to tailor it based on what the person needs. Um, by the way, comment here from Tammy. We love the hippocampus too. Um, who doesn't? It's like a really cute part of the brain. It looks like a little um, kind of cinnamon roll. It's very swirly in, in one of the cuts if you look at it from the front. And then it looks like this kind of like worm type thing if you if you look at it from the side. Um, anyway, you can tell I spent a lot of time in neuroanatomy lab, um, and I find many parts of the brain, pretty much all parts of the brain, really beautiful and intricate. So hippocampus is one of those. Thanks for saying that um, and sharing that, Tammy. Um, so um, let's talk then about how do we prescribe this? How do we make recommendations for exercise? And um, how do we make those person specific? So when we look at the vast amounts of literature, by and large, there's a heavy dose of exercise that um, is done. And heavy dose meaning like three times a week, 45 minutes of exercise, for minimally eight weeks. So that's a lot. And one of the take home points there is that 
I think it's helpful to set up the expectation that this isn't going to occur after a week of exercise, right? Um, it takes a buildup, especially to see some of those prolonged changes. We do know in the literature, there are some immediate changes that occur right away, which is great. Hallelujah. Um, but the, the long-term effects take a buildup. So we need to build it up. Now, this is what I tell people. Don't just dive into 45 minutes if you haven't exercised at all, right? Like you can build that up, um, but get there, set that goal of getting there. And the type of exercise might influence the type of brain change. So a lot of the research is in aerobic exercise. So getting that heart rate up to a moderate or high intensity on the bike, through treadmill training, through high intensity interval training, through exercise group classes, there's many ways to do it, um, but it's it's aerobic. Um, other things where there's a lot of nice research, and I actually just spoke um, with somebody, we did a consult today, we talked about skill training, things like Tai Chi, dance, um, uh, the types of, somebody asked about this in the webinar, but the types of exercise that you might do to follow along with an instructor like boxing, like, um, oh, she brought up a specific like beach body type exercise. So a lot of those are skill training. You're learning different moves. You're putting them together in sequences. You're adding on to it. You're changing it with music. Um, all of those things are skilled based exercises. If you're doing more than one thing at a time, dual task is a skill based exercise. Um, those are things that are very helpful that you have that intensity, but also the progression and the challenge and the feedback with the skill. So that often comes from being working one on one. So you might do that in therapy, you might do that with a personal trainer, but often in a class, in a progressive class um, based setting. So actually, the person that I spoke with today for a consultation is trying um, a week of classes with us to see how that might affect some of his symptoms because there's a lot of variety and skill training. Um, some of the other things that um, he had already been doing, um, they're not enough. So the aerobic training just wasn't quite enough. Um, the resistance or stretching was not quite enough. So we said, let's, let's change it up. Um, and then one final note, I have to make this note because our reactive team is all doing yoga together here in uh, less than an hour. Actually, we're having a group yoga class um, for all of our team. Yoga is a great activity and also can result in brain changes. And one of the uh, particular pieces of that that we see is changes in the autonomic nervous system and improving parasympathetic tone. Um, and a big piece of that is um, based in ancient yoga traditions of breath and um, the movement with breath. So I'm a big fan of yoga for neuroplasticity as well. Um, somebody else asked in the chat here, does exercise with an N95 mass count as aerobic or anaerobic? Yes, yeah, so we are all finding new challenges to our exercise. I run on the weekends with one of our PTs, Amy, and we wear our masks. And that has changed, that has really increased the demand when I am running. Um, and it um, actually makes me think that I am training a little bit harder <laughs> wearing my mask. So um, finally, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what does this mean for neurologic disorders? So I think, first of all, uh, that there's hope. And to me, hope is probably number one important. So even if you've had um, a neurologic disorder for a really long time, even if you've had like a concussion or autonomic symptoms that have kept you from exercising and you have zero tolerance, or maybe you have dizziness that has kept you from being on your feet and pushing your exercise, there are ways, and this is where a big plug for physical and occupational therapy, there are ways to start that, test it, and then gradually grade that 
exercise tolerance up. This is what we do a lot. Um, this is what we um, all, a lot of neurologic physical therapists do is test and train for exercise tolerance and capacity. So I think that's the first thing is even if somebody isn't there now that they can get there and that they have some control over making these brain changes. How awesome is that to have some autonomy and control? Um, I think one of the most important things is that this has to be part of what we do as physical and occupational therapists, build the skills for and the knowledge for exercise for neuroplasticity, build the self-efficacy that a person can take it on and incorporate it lifelong and sustain it, right? Because it's medicine. It's beyond just the eight weeks even, right? It's maintaining that so that we can have those brain changes. Um, the second thing to think about is timing it. So do we want to incorporate some of this exercise, particularly aerobic exercise, as a prep? So really lovely article post-stroke that came out um, a couple of years ago where they did just that. They used aerobic exercise before upper extremity training, and those people had a much better outcome and recovery in their arm capabilities. So time it. So first we have to do it. Then maybe we want to time it with our training and then dose it. So I already said it. I'm going to say it again. It's not something that we can just do or even encourage people to do one week or two weeks or three, but minimum of eight weeks. And then to sustain it, right? Because we do find and the research shows that some of those benefits can diminish over time. So um, there you have it. We talked a little bit about some of the things that have just come out this year, really great reviews and exercise-induced neuroplasticity, how we can take pieces of that evidence to prescribe it to really improve somebody's connectivity. And, and what does that mean for us as therapists and for, for a neurologic disorder? So um, I don't know if you can tell, I get pretty crazy excited about my exercise <laughs> and brain changes. In fact, we, we got so excited, we created a neuroplasticity challenge for our team, part of why we're doing yoga today, 45 minutes three days a week. We put that challenge out to the people we work with too. So we have um, we have many um, people in our wellness programs and patients doing this neuroplasticity challenge and lots of prizes. It certainly motivated me. I'm having my kids do it and they're super motivated. They're going, hey, can I exercise now? Which is like, never happened. So we've been doing all these bike rides and intervals at home. It's been really fun um, and motivating because we're talking at my house, we're talking donuts as a reward. So reward yourself with this stuff. But we're, we're doing a neuroplasticity challenge for the next month to exercise three days a week, 45 minutes in a brain changing way. Um, and as I mentioned, this exercise sets the substrate for the central nervous system connectivity, which is our weekend course coming up in October. Um, we're just less than a month away from that, which I'm really excited. I'll put a link to that as well. Um, and I'll put a link to the webinar that we did on, um, on Monday. So um, several links coming your way. And I will thank you so much uh, for joining me here every Friday, and I will catch you next week.